Hello, everyone. I hope you're back um, with me and the panelists uh, that again participate in this Q and A. I've been looking at the chat and looking at the questions, which are completely fascinating. And I don't know whether we're able to get through them all, but we'll have a go. Uh, it's going to be Minette Batters. I don't know if you can come off mute, Minette. And uh, are you are you with us? I'm here. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Good. I'm so happy that you're here. And uh, Henry Dimbleby, are you with us? Uh, I'm here, Patrick. Great. Brilliant. And Adele Jones, I think she's around somewhere too. So it's the four of us. Now, um, it's going to be quite challenging. I don't know if any, either you, Minette, or Henry have got any ideas, or indeed Adele, who I think is going to help sort of um, go through all the questions which have come up and see if we can navigate through. But we've got an hour. Have you got any thoughts about how we might achieve that? Um, I think we're at a really important moment. I felt this really viscerally, oh God, it seems like an age ago at the Oxford Farming Conference, not the, the virtual one, but the one before that, and moving between the Oxford Farming Conference and the real farming conference. And... Uh, this sense that actually there is no longer a difference on the objective and actually even the differences on the means of achieving the goals are, are, uh, are kind of uh, are contracting. And I think that the work that you've done, Patrick, in bringing together, I think if, I, you know, if someone had told me four years ago that Patrick and Manette were going to be part of, uh, well, maybe not Manette, but Patrick and the president of the NFU were going to be uh, part of a shared group. I think people would have thought I was absolutely insane. And I think that there's a, there's real hope and optimism. I don't envy Adele or her job. And the, the, the devil's in the detail and the detail is really tough, but I am, it's so important and I'm very optimistic and excited to, to see it happening. Well, me too. And I would like to salute your le leadership and your vision, Minette, because your farm manager, Richard Brooks, has been involved with this project right from the beginning. And we've benefited enormously from his insights. So we're really thrilled to be working closely with you. And uh, so thank you for your presentation. Uh, Adele, do you want to say something about how we can navigate through these? All, every single question that's been brought up is good. So how do we do it? Do we just work through them? I mean, I've made a note about them. I think I think there's some themes emerging, Patrick. I think I think we probably can't work through every single one. But um, I was noticing uh, a few questions relating to the fact that this is a global farm metric, and yet so far we've been testing it mainly with UK farmers. And I think I think that that is a really important point. Um, and what what we are planning to do with this work is is use the learnings from what's going on in the UK because it is a really you know fascinating case study of change at the moment here um, but then start to understand you know what's similar in other parts of the world and then and then what needs to be different and we're quite confident that we can reach uh, agreement on a high level framework that is the same for every farm around the world and uh, and then understand where the differences need to need to be for geographies climates social cultural issues as well and that will be a you know a massive part of the work you want to mention just some of the trials that are going on and um, we've got a trial starting in kentucky i believe and i know that one of the uh questions came from cat taylor on the west coast of america who wants to join with her ranch there do you want to say anything about that yes yeah, so uh we are uh, in the process of um of starting to trial the framework in kentucky and I, i've seen the organic association of kentucky on on the on the list of attendees, which is great. And that's that's who we're working with there to make that happen. Um, prior to COVID, we were about to start trialing in New Zealand. That's slightly being put on hold, but hoping to get that up and running again in New Zealand and Australia. Um, we're also really keen to start trialing um, in Africa, in Latin America and India. So I think um, Malawi may well be the, the country that we start with, because there's a research partner over there who's, who's who we're very interested in working with. So. The ball is getting rolling again, um, which is really fantastic. It has. We have been a bit restricted to the UK for obvious reasons over the last year, but um, really, really keen to get going on on understanding how this can work for every farmer around the world. I noticed Judith Batchelor from Sainsbury's has asked a similar question. You know, how can we build this momentum uh, internationally, which is obviously a key issue. 
Well, I mean, any thoughts about that? Minette, well, maybe. Minette, why don't you go first? Yeah. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> Judith is a, a fellow trustee of, of Farm Africa um, with me, which is a, an amazing charity that is all about getting farmers in Africa um, to, to, be, to be farming, to be profitably and sustainably farming and trading. And it's been an enormous success story because that obviously then in very simple terms um, helps them build their local economies. So it's an amazing charity, but it really highlights, I think, not only the intergenerational challenges that we have and we face and the international challenges, but what I think we do see now, and certainly with um, President Biden coming in, is, is a mood change across the world. And what is exciting about this, and I've just come off a call with the sustainability school at, at Harper Adams with Michael Lee, is that people are really excited about how we are going to produce our food in the future rather than as michael just said on this call the history lesson of how we have produced our food in the past so that is all about owning your evidence base if you don't own your evidence base you can't have anywhere to progress from and particularly when we are talking about sustainability we're talking about carbon we're talking about all the opportunities and so to have farmers farmers involved in all of these conversations and farmers coming up with the solutions for how we lead ever more sustainable lives, I think is the exciting time. And when I look back over my farming lifetime, you know, it, it did end up with an approach that was about farming entitlements to a certain extent. And now I feel real energy um, right across my organization. One of the most successful um, live events we've had recently was looking at regenerative agriculture and what that really means and what that means in different areas uh, across the country. So it, it's a huge subject. And I think we go into it, all of us with our eyes absolutely wide open and, and Patrick, as only Patrick can, um, I think the rest of us try and scrabble up to bronze, but Patrick always goes for gold straight away. And, and this, is, this is a gold approach, but it's absolutely what we need to be doing. And, you know, this is being piloted on all sorts of different farms. It's been really interesting to pilot it on my farm and to look effectively at, at how we produce our food, effectively produce more food on less land. You know, that's always being the focus you know how do we get those gains whereby we are decreasing the food production footprint but we are producing the same amount of food how do we focus more on the nutrient density of of what we're producing and how do we well, do it not only here to... but across the world sorry, sorry well, no i just uh, i just wanted to caroline drummond from leap has come on the chat and said that uh leap are working in 21 countries on just on this international front so that's uh, very encouraging. I know from Lawrence Woodward, he's worried about regional variation, indeed just local variation, and he's asking challenging questions about whether the metrics can accurately capture and the units of measurement can accommodate for these differences uh, without sort of homogenizing the unique nature of each farm. And I think that's an important question because, of course, it applies to smallholders. You know, some smallholders may think this is just sort of a, a big food and big ag and big corporate sort of initiative top down. And what about, you know, the heterogeneity of the, of the individual small farms? And Lawrence, I'm, I, you know, I know you can't come on to this because that's the TED formula, but I think that's a really important question that we need to be mindful of in taking this initiative forward. But I think you'd agree, Lawrence, that, I mean, having been an advocate of organic farming, the, the problem with organic stands is they're rather binary. You either are organic or you're not. And what I think the attempt of this initiative to do is to capture impartially the impacts of all farming systems because we need to work together now. So um, do, does anybody want to comment on those, those, those inputs from the panelists or should we go on to something else? Okay, well, uh, Adele, have you got something else you want to highlight that will come well, up? Well, I've got a, a, a related question in the chat here for a minute, which is coming from Tamsin Haradbeck. Um, uh, Tamsin says, um, how do you think the Global Farm Metric Coalition could come together to help the entire supply chain understand the business case for change? 
Um, and I think, you know, we, we're working with a really interesting collaboration of organizations and companies now, but it would be great to hear from you, Manette, to, to understand how you feel um, we can really bring everyone on board with this idea of measuring and reporting in a common way. I, I think the most important thing is that not only can we work collaboratively together at, at farming level, and we are part of the World Farmers Organization, um, which has been a, a, an amazing organization. I mean, you literally have the African subsistence farmers in the room with the US and the New Zealanders and the Europeans and everyone else. And, and it's difficult. It is really difficult. And, and the, the sort of ego comes to the fore because I think some countries struggle to be in the room with African subsistence farmers. But what, what they bring is the challenge that the world faces. And one thing is an absolute certainty, Adele, we cannot do this unless we do it collectively together. Now, the power of technology, the way that everybody, you know, all the African farmers I work with have a mobile phone. You know, they have better connectivity. When I was out in Zambia, it's much better connectivity out in Zambia than it is in Wiltshire, I can absolutely tell you. So we have a way that we can transfer knowledge now. I, I think the danger and the challenge that farmers across the world face is how we work upstream and how we make sure that the gains and, and what we do on the ground, where all farmers, all farmers I speak to, want to leave their farm in a better state because they have a better business on the back of it. But how do we make sure that collaboratively we work with every single partner right the way up through the chain? And there are some brilliant people on uh, this call today who will be shaping that and who will be thinking about it. But there are some who are abusing that and we're lucky really where we farm. Um, when I speak to farmers in other parts of the world, I always remember a very moving presentation from South African farmer who said, you just don't realize how lucky you are to farm in peacetime. And of course we don't, you know, here we are talking about all of this. We forget about the challenges that some farmers in other parts of the world face. So I do think the World Farmers Organization that managed, don't forget to achieve a place uh, at the FAO on the World Food Security Committee. Now, until six years ago, farmers had no voice on the World Food Security Committee. Well, how can you deal with global food security if you are not speaking to one farmer? So that shows, I think, how things are changing. The Paris Accord, again, brought the voice of farmers to climate change. We have the COP26 here in November, which allows us all to go to the next level of what a sustainable agriculture look like across the world. And, you know, I know speaking to farmers in Australia and the US and Africa, many farmers that want to do this. So I think, again, you know, we, we can't get to gold instantly, but we are on the road to trying to get there. And I've seen such change in my time over the last five years, and we just need to work together. Um, I think Henry might have some thoughts. I, I worry enormously about what I would say is the big threat, Silicon Valley, meat free, synthetic meat, all of those sorts of things, um, big, big bucks behind it. And of course, you know, to a certain extent trading, don't forget agriculture is trading with tariffs, with restrictions, you know, all of those things are not. And, and there are some, some strange things happening. So what, what does all that look like? Um, you know, when we're focusing on nutrient density, whole foods, there are some synthetic things coming down the road that I think pose serious questions about how they are traded globally and what they mean uh, to the soil and farmers and the food that we produce. Well, Henry, I'll, maybe you've got want to offer a few reflections. Just one point that's just come in, I see about net zero, and you know, the relationship between assessing farm sustainability in a number of categories which we are proposing and the relationship between that and the many, many food companies that have already set targets, including Morrison's, as David said, of a net zero for some products. How we can integrate that, we believe we can and it's important because otherwise we might get unintended consequences. It might be net zero with a bad effect on biodiversity or something like that. But Henry, some reflections from you at this point. Yes, yeah, so I think that a lot of people have asked the net zero question, and that is uh, a really important question. I was talking to our perm secretary's counterpart in New Zealand, again, what seems like an age ago, but uh, sometime last year when we were, we were free to travel. And he was saying that they're setting a net zero target for 
all of their farms um, unilaterally. And they were trying to work out whether it was across their whole farming system or on each farm. And they actually worked out that for each farm to be net zero could create some quite problematic behaviors because some farming activity, if you're a beef farmer, it basically means that everyone has to have a kind of mixture of everything. And that doesn't necessarily play out well with the land. You end up using the land in the wrong ways because your some of your land might be better for, for beef and some might be better for arable. And so they've gone for a whole system, whole farming system in New Zealand net zero. And then you get the next set of problems, which is it's not good enough actually for farms to be net zero. We actually need our land to be negative, to be net negative because there are emissions from steel, from concrete, from aviation that are not going to be, uh, by anyone's projections, down to net zero by 2050. And therefore, the land is needed to become negative. So I think that what is net zero for any given farm is a, is a really difficult question. And it may be that you have to think about how you are doing the things that you are doing and whether you are doing those. And, you know, I know we've talked about, Patrick, about until you have measures, you might need to have some process um, indicators as, as stop gaps between, between the science. But then the science moves very quickly. I was at a farm yesterday talking to someone who is developing um, a robot that is sniffing soil, and they think they're going to be able to measure the carbon and the carbon change in soil accurately with a drone by sniffing it. Now, who knows if they will or not, but the point is that science doesn't move in a slow progression linearly. It jumps in great bounds. Someone finds out how to do something and it changes everything. So I don't think we, we mustn't let perfection get in the way of the good. We yes, must, that, that's we must an important point. Move, to, move towards things and, hope, and we'll know that it'll get better over time. Somebody has asked exactly that question of how crystallised are our units of measurement, and I think there's an implication that, on the one hand, are we uh, have we have we got anywhere which is solid? But at the same time, the other flip side of that question is, are we open to new technologies, as you've just described? And I think that the answer to that is that we are pragmatic. Uh, we see this as not being trying to. Uh, hold on to the, you, we think that the units of measurement, which our farmers and land management group have come up with, are the best around at the moment. But if some new technology, as you say, Henry, comes along and supersedes the current measure, way of measuring things, we think we should be open to that and move with it. And I just want to make a, a rather controversial comment. It's funny, so many people are saying, and some on the chat, it's going to be very difficult with livestock systems. But funnily enough, I think it might even be easier with beef cattle and sheep, uh, because they can help build soil carbon, which can offset the emissions. And I'm sure I'm gonna have a storm of chat on that or questions, but I think that we haven't seen the end of this discussion about what constitutes a sustainable diet and the role of livestock in sustainable food systems. And I know I will save ground, Minette, saying that with you listening. You certainly are, Patrick. And it's um, it's been, a, I guess, it's a frustrating debate. You know, there are there are some parts of the world that are much better suited to livestock systems than others. You know, we are, I feel incredibly lucky in the UK that we have a maritime climate. You know, when I look at the challenges of fruit and vegetable production across the world, you know, we have the climate that we could be growing much more here. We also have the climate that grows grass that many, many, many countries do not have that luxury that we have. And yet we do an outstanding job of demonizing the jewel in the crown that we have here. Um, so, you know, the focus on how much carbon we actually have locked down in our grasslands is something that needs exploring just as much, probably much more than what will happen if say we choose to set X amount of land aside for planting trees, you know, until we can really truly know what we've got within our grasslands that is locked down, how do we lock ever more carbon down and the value of those grasslands, you know, it isn't, it isn't a simple equation to work through. And, and for too long, the debate has just been about, and if you plant X amount of trees, you deal with the problem. There are enormous problems. I'm not saying we don't need many more trees, we do but we have to focus on the disease, the biosecurity situation. There's a real chance we've already bought Dutch elm, ash dieback, 
We've really got to look at the biosecurity situation of how we, we grow our nursery stock here. And we've got to really understand the true value that is locked down in our grasslands. And actually the amazing success story um, that our grazing livestock, our herds and flocks have been, not least what is often quite a grass-based a dairy system too so well I, I know that Craig Sam's a vegetarian and an old friend of mine who's co-founder of Green and Blacks has just come in and say livestock can be part of the solution so that's encouraging so uh, more comments that we want the questions that have come up Adele that we need to address and can you group them in some way yeah so I've been trying to so there's lots and lots of questions now so I'm trying to uh, trying to trying to group them um, there's quite a few questions about how this fits with DEFRA, uh, in, DEFRA's in, environmental land management scheme and obviously, obviously the equivalents that are going on in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And um, Henry, I, I suppose, um, given, given your position with the natural, uh, National Food Strategy and being a non-executive director of DEFRA, um, I just wondered what your, your thoughts were on that. How do you, what role do you think government has to play in yeah. driving this forward? So, so uh, there are lots of questions about ELMS, Environmental Land Management Scheme. For those, that, for, I'm sure everyone here does know, but that's the our replacement for the Common Agricultural Policy, which is a subsidy of about £3.4 billion pounds a year uh, across the devolved nations. But each nation will be um, working out their own uh, alternative. And the English version is called the Environmental Land Management Scheme, ELMS. And it has to be a huge part of the answer being that much money. And I have two, and, and the team who are doing it at the moment are fantastic, very focused on outcomes, completely understand the need for biodiversity and carbon rather than just focusing on carbon. Um, and it's gonna be a hugely powerful tool. There are two ways I think in which it could go wrong, which I'm very focused on. One is that uh, the money is only, um, guaranteed by the government until the end of this term of parliament. And I worry that in trying to have a very measured rollout, uh, we, we take too much of a risk, uh, a risk free approach and we don't prove enough benefit of the money before the treasury has to, uh, has to decide how much it gives us for the next five years. And so I'm constantly trying to urge, particularly for those, for those of you who are aware of it, I'm very keen that that we don't just do part one, which is the, the smaller kind of farm based payments. We actually have some big progress on part three, which is big landscape scale change um, so that we prove that it can add value this money. And then the second where it could go wrong is that with any change, uh, there will be political noise. Some people will complain about this, that or the other. And I can see that there's a way in which it could just become very much like a, a common agricultural policy by, but by a different name, which no one wants, but it be, within the existing legislation, you could kind of do that. So I think it will be a huge part of the solution. And I think all of us need just to continue to encourage the government to be bold on it, both in do terms of- Do you think they're going to measure- do you think going to measure the impacts using a, a, a framework which is not dissimilar to the one we've been discussing? Yeah, I think that, I think there's definitely. I, I don't. So, or, or I think there is definitely in 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 the first of those the potential to, to use to do that kind of thing. They want it to be output based, but uh, but the 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 concern is that you get, you know, if if an output kind of so it can be gamed you get the big carbon scandal because we didn't quite get the carbon sequ sequestration measure right. And it turned out that loads of public money was given when the carbon wasn't sequestered. And so there's quite a nuanced debate going on about what you do on process and what you do on output. But your measures are exactly the kind of thing that it should be it, people, public goods, public money for public goods, it should be paying people to, to, to use. Well, more questions that have come in that you think could be go to us, uh, Adele, if you've been monitoring them all. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of questions about how this fits with existing certification or labelling schemes. So, for, you know, for example, in, in the UK, we have Red Tractor and Leaf and Organic Soil Association, um, RSPCA Assured. 
uh, all over the world, there's, there's thousands of equivalents. Um, there's been a question about how it fits with the regenerative organic label being developed in, in the States. Um, Patrick, I'm sure you want to say something about that, but perhaps Minette can answer as well. Okay, well, I'll just say this, that I think that there's an absolute compatibility with between a sustainability score and the existing certification schemes. So, for instance, we just had our Soil Association inspection yesterday and the day before online, as it happens. Uh, but actually, the inspection system as it is doesn't measure sustainability impacts at all. And it seems to me that if, the, if there could be a single audit, which I would uh, conduct once a year, then I could give that audit to the Soil Association and say, look, there's my sustainability audit. You may want to ask a few more online questions which are related to organicness, but basically don't replicate the inspection. There's no need anymore. So we want harmonization. We want to avoid repetitive audits which are expensive and time consuming. And I think that same answer could be given. And I think would be agreed by Caroline Drummond, who did a brilliant job on, on farming today this morning, and indeed for the red tractor people who we have met and discussed this with. So there's going to be a degree of adjustment, but I believe this can be compatible with existing certification schemes. Minette, over to you. Patrick, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think we tend to forget and certainly consumers never really realize what, what a massive uh, success story certification has been. Um, because it allows people on, on all sorts of different budgets to have absolute assurance from farm to fork as, as to how that food has been produced. There is, I think, a big challenge around consumer understanding of, of actually, you know, what these certification schemes really mean. Um, but as we go forward into um, more globalised trade, more of a liberalised world, these certification schemes will become absolutely essential. I hear so many times, you know, well, the opportunity is to bring in cheap raw ingredients and add value under the Union Jack. The certification schemes are a key to honesty for, for everybody. Just, just jumping back to what Henry was saying on, on the budget, I think I'm, I'm actually always amazed at how much we, we get into a sort of spin around the budget. I mean, just to put it into context, even if we, if we manage to save 20% or sort out 20% of food waste, where I think we currently waste 16 billion pounds worth of food, we'd have the budget. The budget actually covers uh, central government and its departments for a three week period per annum. So when I look at, you know, um, four nations, 70% of which is a farm landscape and all that has been achieved, the third most affordable food per income spend in the world, the UK was, was the leader, if you like, on, on agri-environment schemes. 25 years ago now, and we have the opportunity to, to take it to the next level, to really drive a global agenda on sustainable farming. And, and if we can't make the case between all of us for three billion pounds of, of investment, then my goodness, we all ought to pack up and go home. So I think it might need to be, and maybe should be, when I see the health and well-being benefits of getting out, the green gym, all those other things, Maybe it should be a, a bigger budget, but we've got to make the case for one single pound of taxpayers' investment. And uh, that means we've all got to do it together as, as a whole chain approach. And that I've continually tried to focus on, that this isn't just about farmers, this is about everyone making the case for that. But, you know, what uh, you have to ask yourselves, what, what is there that is more important? You know, we look at our National Health Service, our schools, you know, those journeys throughout our lifetimes, those journeys back to health, they have to start with, you know, high quality, nutrient dense food. And there's a big conversation to be had around procurement going forwards uh, when we look at actually what sourcing policies are going to be. Henry, do you want to answer a question I see has just come in about the Discupta review and whether the Treasury are going to review that? That was addressed to you. So, um... It's a very good question, actually. I don't know the answer to it. I mean, my, my guess is that they, the, the reason it was commissioned was because uh, the government have adopted a, uh, a natural capital approach and they were trying to find out ways of valuing capital. And uh, they still have a commitment to update the Green Book, the way in which they value projects. So the, the whole point of it was to say, we need to start valuing government spending, not just in terms of pounds return but we need to put the cost of nature in there so i would i would have thought that there would there, there's a formal process of re review and response to it but i don't know actually i'm going to ask my team to 
to find out because it is. And, and if anyone's had a chance to read it, I'd urge you that there's, there's the 600 page version, which he wrote every word of. And then very reluctantly, he was, it was suggested he should do a, a summary and, uh, uh, and they helped him do a summary, but it's not nearly as good. If you have the time and you really want to understand the limits of our planet and the, the way in which we've damaged nature, uh, it, it is the most terrifying, brilliant, fascinating 600 pages that you'll ever read. So I really would urge people to read it. It's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question now. It's a technical question. There are some incredible questions coming up in the Q&A. There's a lot of fascinating chat. Are we going to record both? Is that possible? And in time, maybe we can we come back and answer some of these questions because they're really important and it would be a shame to lose them. So I think we can make a commitment that the very least we'll do is record the Q&A and the chat, and hopefully make it available if people want to ask us for it after this. And then with a bit of luck and the following win, we'll try and answer the questions that haven't been answered during this discussion. So um, Adele, would you like to bring anything else up that's come up that's uh, leaping to your attention? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, there's been a couple of questions from Anne Cox and Hayden Evans about the possibility for this global farm metric to be used as a basis for trading decisions. I know it was mentioned a little bit in the in the pre-records. Um, so Patrick, Minnett and Henry actually, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Use for what? Use for what? Sorry, I missed that as well. Sorry, trade, trading, trade, global trade. Yeah, I've got lots of thoughts on that, but Minette, Minette, Minette might go first. Yeah, so have I, but Minette, we, we, we bow to your superior oversight. <laughs> Um, well, absolutely, it has to. Um, it, it really has to, but we, we shouldn't be, I guess, short-sighted in the challenges that, that we face. Um, so influencing the WTO is, is absolutely critical. The WTO is, having been out there, is completely different to, to anything else. You don't go out there and, and lobby the WTO. You go out there, I mean, it's, it's infested with sharks and, and you put down the problem areas. So reform of the WTO is, is I think, gonna take time. Again, I think the Biden administration probably adds a lot of value to that, but it's not gonna happen overnight. But how we trade our agricultural commodities is fundamentally flawed. I mean, it, it just does not work at the moment. And that is because, surprise, surprise, you know, governments across the world are focused on keeping food prices down and keeping food affordable. Um, and, and therein lies the massive problem that we face. But we are making progress. And when I look at what we've achieved on things like antimicrobial resistance, you know, making sure that we are lowering and we have dramatically lowered our use of, of antibiotics. And of course, that has had a massive effect on human health as well and responsible use of animal medicines and the work that, that things like rumor have done. So this is all within the art of the possible, but it's it's really difficult. And I think that that is the challenge that we face with food. I'm I'm always amazed at, you know, everybody loves talking about the environment. Who doesn't? We all do as farmers. I certainly love talking about it. But the moment we talk about food production, you know, the, the hackles start to, to rise and we've got to really celebrate success. And we've got many things to celebrate in this country, but this has got to be really true and meaningful. And all roads lead back to the evidence base. You know, you've got to be able to show the evidence base of how you are producing that food. But honestly, in these trade negotiations, the work of the Trade Agricultural Commission, I don't know how many of you have read what I think is a very, very good report with some very, very good recommendations in it. But, you know, we've got the carbon border adjustment tax conversation going on in Europe at the moment. It's not going on at the agricultural level, I might add. So, uh, well, on... I was on one of your co uh, committees for that review and uh, I was like a dog with a bone. I said, look, if every farmer in the world measured their sustainability impacts with the, a common framework and language, we could use that as a basis for international trade. What's your view, Henry? So I think that, there, that on trade, there have been some major steps forward from where we were uh, six months ago. So the government uh, are moving very strongly towards, uh, uh, they've said they will, and I think they will protect our standards. The Trade and Agricultural Commission, which has some people who are pretty free marketeer on it, 
unanimously published a report that said recommendation eight, it's all about recommendation eight. You don't need to read any of the other recommendations. Recommendation eight says that uh, we will not allow um, food in from abroad that is lower than our standards, that we will publish we will publish what our base standards are. So there's a bit of work done there to say what are the British so standards. Could the base standards be what we've been talking about today? In other words, a, a common framework for measuring everything. Well, that it would also have to include not just the metrics, but where you are against them. But I think I think it's it's likely to be initially something sim uh, simpler, and then you would have a um, a system whereby if I'm an American farmer, in the same way that an organic farmer, um, a dairy farmer, has to have a certification to export their milk to America because the American organic standards are higher for milk, have to be higher for milk and on antibiotic use. Uh, you, as an American farmer, you would have to ha be certified to bring your uh, food into this country. The issue is, and th this is the next frontier which Manette alluded to, is that we're only going to learn more about how we're damaging the environment. We're only going to learn more about animal sentience. I'm, I, I'm, I'm convinced that we will think very differently about animals in 20 years' time than we do now. And so well, our stand... Why can't the Prime Minister go to the COP26 and say, look, we need an international, internationally harmonised standard for measuring the impacts of our farming system, and we should move towards a situation where international trade in food would only be allowed if the farming systems are addressing climate change, are reversing biodiversity loss and all the other things. Why, would, why couldn't we lead the world at the COP26? Well, I think that's, that's, where, that's where we should be... Uh, that's where we should be heading. My concern is that if that is so, Liz Truss, for example, has said we should lead the world. We should, we should um, persuade COP that this is the direction of the future. We need to to trade more sustainably. But if that gives you the excuse not to, to unilaterally not to do it, I think that's problematic. So I think you have to be prepared for the fact that you might fail, or as Manette says, that might take longer than you think. And you have to be prepared to move unilaterally. And so my a lot of what I'm focusing on for part two of my strategy on the trade side is if you raise your standards. So, for example, uh, you know, near nicotinoids, a massive issue in Europe, because what happened when we banned neonics is that our rape crop failed and we just imported loads of rape from countries that were using neonics. And so we need to find a way for where, where we raise standards in this country. We don't unfairly penalise. We don't effectively just export those harms abroad. And I think you have to do the two things simultaneously. You have to shoot for the, for the, for the kind of WTO reform, but you've also got to really be strong about your standards and be prepared to move unilaterally in your country as well. Well, I'm sure Minette would want to comment on that. It seems to me, though, that if we measure using harmonised frameworks, these political decisions, because they are political, let's be honest, about which we allow and which we don't allow, at least can be measured using a framework which is harmonised. And it seems to me that's there's no risk for the Prime Minister to say we need that. Absolutely, no risk at all. This. What do you think, Manette? No, that there is there is no risk at all. I, I, I think, you know, first we have to, um, and probably Henry's, well aware of this as, as part of the non-exec or the chair of the non-exec team in DEFRA. You know, it's, it's about joining up all these elusive dots. So, you know, we all very work, much work with, with DEFRA. I've actually been working more and more closely with the Department of International Trade. Um, but, you know, the, the join up across government, um, it was great to see the Prime Minister. I know he was in North Wales and I was with him on Friday in Derbyshire. But you know, it's fair to say that he is several steps away um, from well, from farming, from rural Britain. And, and who can blame him? Because he's got a huge amount piled up on his desk. And, and that, I think, is the challenge to get everybody sort of closer linked. We're so far away from how our food is produced. All of us, government in particular, a long way away, actually, from sustainable food production from the opportunity. So we, we've got to get people back to understanding the opportunities. And I think for so long, we talk about the problems and what we have to do, and Patrick, what you are doing is putting the solutions in place. So yeah, we've got a problem here, but this is the solution to it. And um, it all roads lead back to, 
to sharing our data and owning our evidence? Well, more questions. Adele, can you help? Yeah, so I've got a really interesting one and, and uh, just switching the, um, the focus a little bit to what citizens can do, because ultimately, you know, this, this countdown event is, is about um, what farmers can do, but also what, what citizens can do. Um, and there's a great question here from Max Fraser, who says, as a citizen, I feel exhausted trying to navigate around the toxicity of the world we've built. Farming practice, animal welfare, pesticide use, air miles, packaging, human exploitation, false marketing claims, etc. When do you envisage the time where citizens can truly feel like they're not contributing to the problem? problem? Henry? <laughs> So a really, really interesting question. Short answer, I think that the full transition is 35, 40 years before you actually get whether you're not contributing to any problem, um, you know, but I, I, it's, it's taken us 35 years to get the food system into the state it's in now. It's not going to unwrap quickly. And if you look at, you know, and, and it, we are at the forefront of it. You look at Brazil and America and the, the, the economics, untwisting un, un those economics can be very, very difficult. What I do feel very strongly, though, is we, we've held citizens' dialogues all across the country from, you know, Northeast and Grimsby and Cumbria, down in the Southwest, and people are similarly exhausted. So people, when you educate them about the system, it, what, we had a summit with them last week, we brought them all together, and the number who changed their behaviours was amazing, really, really fascinating. But they don't really have the space in their lives to make the choice. So I do not think that uh, an approach which basically just gives the consumer choice is going to work. You can't just have marks. You need to have the measures, but then government needs to do two things. Uh, it needs to, well, actually three things. It needs consistently to be raising the regulation baseline all the time that's just got to go up it's got to click up and click up and click up and at the same time it needs to be continuing to pay for public goods and be much more active in the way in which it regulates and the way in which it punishes polluters and actually while the fourth thing is maintaining that trade barrier because if you do all that and don't deal with the trade you just uh, you destroy all british farmers and um and export the problems abroad. But I don't think this is a consumer. I, you know, consumers just about talking, we've got, I've been talking to all the CEOs, the supermarkets picking at their data. They, they, they will pay more for British. They buy British from most consumers and they like that. And so I think that the, if you want consumers to go for things, you just need to raise standards, put the value into the British mark. But it has to be a government uh, initiative. It can't be something that you rely on consumers because people's lives... It's so complicated and they just don't have the time and nor should we expect them to become Well, I was, I was speaking to Sir Dave Lewis, ex-boss of Tesco, so now chair of WWF yesterday. He more or less said exactly what you said, but I put it to him. I said, look, it's incredibly difficult for citizens that in their role as consumers to navigate this very confusing plethora of different marks and schemes. And surely if you gave them something which was really open and transparent, maybe with a sustainability score on it, which had some credibility behind it, don't you think we could harness their power to drive the change as well? We can't wait for governors. We know if we wait for government, we might be waiting too long. So there must be something that happened in the marketplace. What do you think, Manette? Something better than now, I mean, because let's say now is fine. You said we can't imagine what we need to do next. And you, you, I thought I was very inspired by that. You said, look, we need to think about things in new ways. Surely we can do better on food labeling. I, I think we can, um, but I, for me, starting, just jumping back to the, the question, um, you know, for citizens, it's pretty confusing and it, it's very easy now to be driven by one soundbite on social media and if you're not equipped, you, you are just following that soundbite on social media that is probably just a, a wholly dishonest comment. So all roads lead back to, to education. And, you know, we've been very much involved in a, a massive project around STEM, using agriculture for STEM learning effectively. And it's been quite incredible to, to witness. And until we 
decide to educate primary school children around understanding how their food is produced, around understanding how food must be valued, they will never value the environment, nature or the food that they eat. So we can't expect citizens to just suddenly be able to go out there and make informed decisions that it's got to start with education. And, and that to me, until that happens across the world, we are going to continue with, with the challenge. And no matter how much citizens uh, outside the store say, yep, yeah, they believe in animal welfare, they believe in environmental protection, 90% go in there and buy on price. And who can blame them? Because they haven't been on that journey. And the social influences now through social media are enormous. And when we talk about, you know, what Henry says about clicking up regulation, what we can't keep, we are all producing food for the same price that we were 20 years ago. And you look at where regulation has gone in that time. So this is a massive challenge uh, that we have to get how we are trading right. You know, we got, as Tim Lang always says, less than 8% of the value chain going back to farmers. So we've got to look at this in the round uh, and, and sort the business case, as you always refer to, Patrick, out. But... There's a massive appetite to do this now. And it's yeah. difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. But it's, you know, we, we're starting. I mean, you look at where we are now compared to where we were. Well, I'm sure everybody will agree that uh, education is necessary. So it's rather... I, I, would, I, rather like to, I want to challenge the education point because I think it's very, very dangerous. So the, the kind of common view, the sun says, what we need to do is educate people and get them to exercise more. And it's like this, it's a libertarian argument. You educate people and they exercise and then it's all about them doing what they think is right and it's about willpower. And I think it's fundamentally wrong. Well, I, I our, wasn't children, our children know and care much more about this than most adults do. Uh, I think we need to educate skills, so cooking skills, and we need to focus on skills, but the no education of knowledge as a fallback is the fallback I hear from the, from the free marketeers, and I think it's a very dangerous trope, and we need fundamentally to recognise in my talk, the feedback mechanisms, that vicious one on health that's linking the commercial and our appetite, and the lack of a balancing feedback mechanism in the economy on, on, uh, on environment, are a hundred times more important than improving education. So it's not that I don't want to improve education, I just think it is the SOP for, and I don't know, I don't know how old your kids are. My kids uh, at the local state school in London, in East London, know more about, educated more about food, climate change, the environment than I ever was when I was a kid. And they're much more uh, on it than me. And they, they hold me up on it. So I, I just, it's not that I don't think education is important. I just think it's, it's a dangerous way of kicking things into the long grass. Well, sorry, somebody sorry, just said no. in the chat they were exhausted what? by the more educated they were, the more exhausted they became. But Adele, I noticed that somebody else has said in the chat that all these questions are getting ranked and we need to look at the top ranking questions because it's not fair because they're being voted on and we're ignoring that. So can you can you uh, help us with that? I can give you the top. The top rank question is, do you see the future of food production and consumption? as necessarily more local? And if so, how do the supermarkets and food industries, which are part of this initiative, propose to support this aim? And that's from Liam M. Right, you better answer that then, Henry. Well, I, I've got okay, quite a lot of thoughts on local, but I think maybe Minette should go first. <laughs> All right, Minette, is it local? And can we, can we admit that we can't grow tea, coffee and bananas, but in relation to staple foods, do you think we should, there should be a relocalization of food systems? Patrick, look, I can't just let the <laughs> very quickly on education. I wasn't talking about exercise. I was talking about inspiring people to love and value food. That's what I was talking about. I trained as a chef. I'm passionate about it. And we don't love and value our food or we wouldn't throw it away. You know, so we've got to learn to value it. And that education is probably the wrong word. It's about inspiring a nation. That's yeah. what it's I about. agree. Cultural change, changing the story. Okay. Cult uh, education is a small part of cultural change. We yeah. need to change the whole story about food that people tell about food. I agree with you on that. I, and that links into the next point about, about the localised agenda. I, I think when we talk about local, we absolutely have to talk about added value. At, at the moment, what has been the massive success story has been things like microbreweries, or it was until COVID struck and, and we stopped drinking beer at the scale that we were. But if we can talk about added value agendas and getting back to a more localised 
food systems that add value into those areas, then that, that is a win-win for everybody. We should be under no illusions about how we've ripped that infrastructure out um, in our quest to make sure that food is as affordable as it is now. And retail has been a huge success story. But again, this space is changing and online shopping over the last year has just been exponential. And I do see many farmers of the future, they will have to control their risk. So being able to sell online to have control of a whole chain approach of whatever that area is, is going to make a massive difference to farm businesses. With a loss of, of direct support as we know it, we are going to have to look very differently at how we manage our risk and getting back to a more localized owning, I would say that whole value chain is going to be absolutely critical. And do you think that supermarkets will have to uh, adjust their supplies? Because as you will know, as, uh, as I know, as an ex-carrot grower uh, who uh, became a casualty of centralized packing, do you think there's gonna have to be some infrastructure change? We're already seeing it in some areas of, of retail in different parts of the country whereby they are sourcing, you know, locally they have an area that is that is dedicated to that. I know, you know, quite a few of the major retailers that are doing that. But this is all about customer demand. You know, if the demand is there, it, it will happen. Um, I think we've got to accept that we have created, um, you know, a very challenging beast where at the moment everybody to a certain extent suffers. And what we have seen on the back of COVID, retailers had a lot of criticism over the years, but it has become more and more loyal to British. So the reason prices are where they are now, and in many cases still going up, is because British retail has got very close uh, to British farmers and growers. What we must have is that same ambition spreading into the out of home sector. And I'd love to know what Henry thinks about how we build those safe, secure supply chains in out of home, which is 50% of the value of the food market, which at the moment I would say is a very murky area on transparency and provenance. And it's very hard to know, particularly with wider trade deals, you know, is it genuinely British? Is it genuinely high welfare? It can say it is. How does anybody know exactly what it is? They don't well, know. That's the point. Maybe you'd like to answer that, Henry, and then I'll go to Adele to see if she's got any comments or anything that's been said or, or raise more questions yeah. to her. So I think the local question is fascinating. So, you know, I'm someone who loves buying local. I love meeting my local suppliers. Even like, you know, even if it's going to the local cost cutter and chatting to the guys there about what they're bringing in, you know, it's not just the local farmer. And so I value local a lot. We started off looking at this, trying to understand, should government subsidize local? So was local better in a way the non-local and obviously you then get into all of the complications about you know local doesn't necessarily mean good carbon it doesn't necessarily mean better food it doesn't necessarily mean anything and what i've come to believe certainly in the in the public sector and we're trying to work out about the private sector is that it's actually about love it's about care and so if you look at the councils that have done uh made efforts to buy local it wasn't that they uh that they that they that there was a benefit to buying local per se it was that by forcing themselves to look at the local rather than just going for the easy choice the cheap choice the 3663 or whatever they just thought about food a bit more and so i'm very keen that uh, that there's there's a fantastic procurement trial in the southwest where uh, or hospitals and things are, are, are being encouraged to buy locally. And I think that the main part, I'm really keen that this gets very quickly rolled out across the country, is because when you're talking about local, you're just comparing, you're thinking about your food more, valuing it more, you're thinking, you know, you can't pass a law that makes people cook good hospital food. It's about care. And so I think local is all about care. And we're, we haven't quite got there in terms of what the recommendation is, but we've probably spent more time tussling with this thing because it's the one area where people feel very strongly instinctively about it but it actually when you dig into it the, the, what it actually means it means different things to different people thank you we're coming to the end of our time i'm not sure if we get guillotined at five o'clock but even if we don't i expect minette and henry have probably got other demands on their time so maybe um adele have you got any uh, i'll get guillotined about... by my wife 
Have you got any thoughts about taking things uh, forward uh, before we, we just summarise um, and then we must end? Well, I think um, I have been trying to sort of span all the questions that have been coming in and um, and, a, and a couple that caught my eye, uh, which I think would be really nice to end on actually is, is uh, what what does success look like? Um, and I think that would be useful to, to hear from, from, from you th three in particular. I just want to make one point of clarification because there has been quite a lot of questions about the practicalities of this on the ground. How do farmers actually do this? Um, and uh, as we mentioned, we've been trialing this framework in the UK and we're starting the trials elsewhere. And for those trials, we have developed a really simple self-assessment tool. And by simple, I mean simple technology. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, uh, it, that's totally open for anyone to use. If, if any farmers are listening who, who want to give that a go, please just email our, our info at sustainablefoodtrust.org email address and we can send that to you. It is not the thing that is going to take this global farm metric to scale. And that's where we see all the technology companies and existing tool providers and certification schemes around the world coming in to play their role. We want to provide the metric, the protocol, if you will, for measuring and reporting. And that can then be overlaid onto new or existing tools to, to be rolled out all across the world. Um, so just wanted to add that point of clarification, but um, to back to the, the, the farming and climate change and the global farm metric, I think let's end on, on what we think success would look like. Henry? Right, um, I guess it better be short in case they guillotine us. Yeah, we're, not yes, be sure. we're not going to be guillotined, but oh, good. Let's, That's keep, right. let's keep it short. <laughs> so I think we need, I think this sounds, to some people when I say it, it sounds, they say this is just too idealistic. But if you look at how, how much our food culture has changed in such short time, I think we should think we can change it in another way. And I think primarily we need to change our food culture in the UK away from one in which food has become simply uh, a convenience, a source of sustenance and a source of indulgence where we care about our food we care about who we cook it for, and we care about the way in which we cook it. And we rebuild a pride in a national food culture. There is a, a, a thing going around on Twitter of what the Japanese think of various people. And against the French, it says, um, no fat people. And against the Norwegians, it says, everyone is happy. And against the, uh, the UK, it just says, bad food. And uh, that isn't who we are anymore. Our food has changed enormously in the last 20 years. Our food culture has changed. And it's not just a middle class thing. And we need to build that care and that value of food and, and, and intertwine that, weave it into our culture. And we can introduce as many laws and taxes and incentives as we like. But until we change how we feel about food, we won't change anything. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. Minette. Patrick, well, firstly, thank you to you and Adele for the opportunity to, to be with you today. Um, for me, and I've said it on, on other occasions, you know, this, this can be, this must be, this has to be, I think, the decade of farmers. Um, our total reliance on, on the world's finite resources cannot continue. So I do think we have an, all, an enormous opportunity, not only in the sustainable production of food, but also the sustainable production of fibres that will biodegrade. And we haven't even touched the sides on the opportunities around degradable fibres yet. So for me, it, it is all about the, defining the new policy. You know, we've ripped up all the old rule books, whatever you thought of them, this country has made a democratic decision and we have a, a new opportunity as the one sector that is, yes, a source of emissions, but can do something about it. So we have a unique opportunity to lead the change that I believe the whole world uh, is totally reliant on. It, it is the opportunity that we choose to make it. And uh, so success for me is very much uh, at the COP26 this year, uh, the prime minister talking about fantastic sustainable uh, food production, um, rather than just focusing on what I feel is a slightly mealy-mouthed area of nature-based solutions, which covers up a, a lot of things. Let's talk about what we're trying to do and let's drive the ambition for sustainable food production uh, and sustainable fibres and the massive, massive opportunities for both the public and private sector to come together. 
Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Manette and Henry, for participating in this Q&A. Uh, I would like to finish by thanking all the coalition stakeholder partners uh, who are committing their time and their energy and resources to build this, what I believe could be uh, a true uh, piece of UK leadership in brokering a new deal uh, of internationally harmonised um, metric for measuring farm sustainability and indeed land use sustainability, forestry, other forms of land use as you just intimated to Minette. And I, I think that uh, imagine a world where all the farmers were farming in harmony with nature, produce, uh, reducing climate change by locking up CO2 in the soil and increasing biodiversity and producing nutrient dense food. That is a future that we need to step into. And I think if we are measuring the impacts of our farming practice, that's a future which is, is going to become more and more possible. So uh, we are deeply committed in the Sustainable Food Trust to just being a steward of this uh, coalition, which will have to have its own governance in time. We can only be the midwife for it, really. But uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers, the Prince of Wales, um, Johan Rockstrom, although he didn't do it for us, I think he's a, he is an important person. Minette, Henry and David Potts uh, for your wonderful contributions. To thank all, all the people who have been on this webinar and the Q&A and have stayed with us to the end. And we're committed to take things forward. So thank you very much indeed.